Okay, I'm recording. Okay, so if you accept and record, then we will be here together in posterity. Okay, so um, those of you who are members, raise your hand if you are members of Katisa. Okay, and some of you are not members at this moment, but perhaps you'd consider it because you know what? Katisa is awesome. Katisa has a very vibrant community. Um, mostly we're in California, but ever since the pandemic, we have spread out. We've got a lot of people from other places. In fact, Patrick, one of our coordinators, is no longer in California, right? Where are you? I'm, I'm currently living in Portland in Oregon. Yeah, so we still accept him here at Katisa. Yes, and we have people from across the country as well. We have a peer reviewed language publication, the Katisa Journal. And uh, one of the journals a couple of years ago, which was co-edited by several of us here, Donna Brinton, who might be coming today, uh, is all on pronunciation. So be sure to check it out because it's free and available to you, whether you are a member or a not, not member, and you have access to it on the Katisal.org website. Uh, we also, if you're a member, you get our monthly, at least monthly, Katisal update announcements of things that are going on within the organization and related orgs. You get discounts to regional and state conferences. If you're a member, you can belong to any number of interest groups. TOPS, of course, is your first one. And different levels, that means you're at K-12, adult, uh, community college, college and university, IEP and chapters. So chapters is basically uh, based on regions of California. And of course, you'll have the opportunity to interact with us and network and do social learning and teaching with other members of the Katisal community at our conferences and at our online events. So this way you have a chance to have discussions with each other, whether it's in person or online. If you're looking for a job, and I see that we might have some people who are recent graduates from graduate school and going into the field and are looking for work, there is a job bank. In many cases, the IGs will record the sessions. And then in my other hat as web manager, I will add them to our online training list and then you can get access to those videos. Not every IG records all events, but tops being tops, we do. So you'll be able to get access to the recordings. Those of you who are looking for a little monetary assistance to go to events like uh, conferences, whether they're chapter related or regional or state, there are grants and there are also awards for excellence in certain aspects of teaching. So those are all available to members as well. Now, I just want to show you a couple of pictures because, you know, Marty and I have known each other for a little while. I just told or chose a couple of recent ones. Here's where we were together with many others. This is one, one small group of us uh, Supras. People are very interested in pronunciation, especially Supra, segmental, prosody, and that sort of a thing. And we were at Seattle having dinner together. So you can see there's Lynn uh, Henriksen and Judy Gilbert and me and Marty and Donna Britton. So that was back in 2017 at Seattle. More recently, those of us who dared to travel and travel abroad, yes, Canada is considered to be abroad. You do need to take your passport. Then here's a picture of Marsha and Marty and Beth Zielinski at the Pronunciation in Second Language Learning and Teaching Conference. And that was held at Brock University in the Niagara Falls region of Ontario, Canada. So that was lots of fun and we got together. That's when I tapped Marnie on the shoulder. And I said, Marnie, why don't you come and speak to us? Because you have so much to say based on your very rich experience and training and publications. Marty Reed is from Boston University and she directs the TESOL 
education program. So can you imagine what it's like to be a student of hers? It's probably exciting all the time. I bet it's just like this. Isn't that right, Marty? It's like everybody's going 40 miles an hour and keep on going and writing and thinking and writing and trying out new things, right? So Marty does a lot of different kinds of lectures. She's done so many different publications. She's worked for TESOL, nominating committee. She's done so many things that it's just hard to keep up with her. She and John Levis edited the Handbook of English Pronunciation. She's got an issue that's coming up called the Integrated Approach to Pronunciation, Listening, Comprehension, and Intelligibility in Theory and Practice. Those are just a couple of her publications that I are really important to our field of pronunciation. And as I said before, what is the other half of pronunciation that's really important for us to consider? Not really in the minds of a lot of people when they think about communication, but the other half of it is listening. And what do we do more of? Listening or speaking? In our whole life, what do we do more of? Listening. Right? So she's going to talk to us a lot about listening and how we should approach this as educators. So let me just hand it over to Marnie Reed. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, okay, let me do a screen share. Well, let me just say hello, first of all. Now I get to see you all. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Um, my students, I'm not sure that they're always um, as excited as Marcia thinks they should be. These are the master's students in, in TESOL. Uh, but anyway, thank you so much for coming. It's wonderful to see you. Um, so if you don't mind, I'm going to spend just the first couple of minutes um, sharing why I became interested in this in the first place. So I should just tell you, I have been hooked <laughs> my whole entire professional career, hooked and puzzled about listening. So it started something like this. I moved to Boston in 1975 and I needed a job and I had done some little things before as a teaching assistant when I was doing my own master. So I thought, oh yeah, I can resurrect that ESL stuff that I did. I confess, I have no master's in TESOL, no formal training. I had not a clue what I was doing. And I accepted a position uh, at a private language school in the heart of Boston, just down the street from where the Boston Marathon always ends. And um, the uh, owner of this private language school recruited um, primarily in South America. So there were a lot of students from Venezuela and other countries. They were very um, loquacious. They would talk to you about their professions or their families. They would discuss the meaning of life. They loved to talk. Um, and they began pestering me and other teachers saying, we can't understand anybody. <laughs> and um, in the beginning, I will confess, I didn't believe it. How could people who could produce so much language claim that they couldn't understand when people were talking with them? This made no sense to me. I didn't believe them, frankly, but they pestered me and one other teacher in this school. She happened to be a former teacher trainer from uh, the Peace Corps. She knew what she was doing. So after a while, we began pestering the director of the, of the program and that we wanted to have a special separate listening class. And um, it took a lot of pestering. And finally, in order to make us go away, I think, he said, okay, here's the deal. The students are here five days a week, nine until four. And nine o'clock sort of meant, or whenever. <laughs> so the culture just said, you know, classes start in, in the morning sometime. Um, and he said, we can't keep them here after four. So, okay, here's what we'll do. We will offer a listening class, pro bono, eight o'clock in the morning go for it, get out of my office, go away, leave me alone, go do it. So we, we were all excited. We thought we won, we prevailed. Oh, wow. Oh, 
hmm, I guess we better develop some materials. Okay, let's think about that. And so we did this. Now, eventually we, we realized that pro bono meant the students were not asked to pay extra for this listening class and we weren't getting paid for it. <laughs> but anyway, he made us go away and so forth. Okay, so one of the things we did was develop um, some dictation sentences. We thought, well, let's do a needs analysis and, and see what's really going on. I will be showing you some slides in a short while to tell you this is when I began to realize, oh, this is what they mean when they say they don't understand. They could produce a lot of language. They could talk a lot. And they couldn't understand the same kinds of words that they used in their everyday conversations when they were listening to other people on the street. So that really piqued my interest. Uh, now, there is an interesting outcome to this little story, and that is that um, months and months later, the students kept coming month after month, session after session. They kept coming at eight o'clock in the morning and we kept not being paid. But anyway, uh, and then one day um, the director got he was sitting in his office and he got a phone call from the dean of advanced engineering across the river at MIT. And this person had opened up his the yellow pages of his phone book. I don't know if there's anybody here who's old enough to know what a phone book is and what the yellow pages. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> so anyway, he was he was going through the directory, calling up language schools. Here's the problem: he had um, students from Japan uh, taking a two-year master's in advanced engineering. They were stuck with these students. They couldn't make them go away because they bought them here and some of them even brought their spouses and they wouldn't go to class and so the faculty would go to them and say you've got to show up in class and then the department chair would say you what you aren't coming to class and then the dean got on their case you've got to come to class and they basically said there's no point we even tape recorded the classes and we go back to our apartments and we play the tape recorder and we try to transcribe it and then after a while we give up we haven't, we can't understand anything. Uh, so we're just going to read the, all the materials. And <laughs> they kept trying to say that you can't get a master's degree from MIT just by reading the textbook, you gotta show up in class. Um, and so then we were puzzled. Well, these students um, were able to, to get into MIT because of their high TOEFL scores. But if you remember in the mid 70s, um, the TOEFL was not, it had some reliability, but not face validity in that it was not testing listening in those days. Nowadays, of course, they do, but in those days, it was prescriptive grammar. Do you know when to use few versus, you know, I uh, have few versus many or you know, prescriptive grammar rules. So, so anyway, my, my director said to this, uh, this dean over at MIT, oh, you have come to the right place. We have the experts here, seek no further. So they sent us over to MIT and then I finally got paid to do this. So that's how I initially became interested. So now I'm going to do a screen share and I'll talk to you about my current interest because there were three precipitating events that caused me to think, okay, I, I now know what the problem is, but what do we do about it? Uh, so uh, I decided we've got to figure out what to do about it. Here are the precipitating events. Um, the first, if you'll notice on the side here, English for New Bostonians and the Somali Development Center. I had a doctoral student who um, uh, applied for a grant from this grant funding agency, English for New Bostonians. And the grant was funded. And as a result, my doctoral student was able to set up a dedicated uh, English ESL classroom in the, the refugee center here in Boston. We have a very, very large population of Somali and other refugees. Um, so, and, and this, they operate in a, what's called a triple decker, a typical Boston building. It's a, basically a house, three-story house. They offer many, many social services. But the director struggled to offer consistent ESL classes. And he was constantly being asked by mothers whose children were 
in the public school system and who had some free time during the day, could they please offer ESL? They wanted to learn English. Okay, so with this grant, here's what we did. Um, they created a dedicated space with a door. So to minimize distractions, an actual classroom space. Some of you may know my colleague, Steve Malinsky. He's the author of the Side by Side uh, <laughs> series, the word by word picture dictionary. And anyway, so my colleague um, uh, donated sets of materials for the side by side textbooks, student workbook, student classroom book, teacher's manual, um, all the levels, you know, from uh, beginner through advanced. So now we've got textbooks. And then the last thing that we did um, was uh, create a service learning component in Professor Malinsky's introductory methods course. There was prior to this, there was no pre-practicum in the methods course. The students did their student teaching in their second semester. But here we, we said, this is wonderful. Our students will have an opportunity in their very first semester to actually teach. We won't start in the first week. The students have to learn a few things first, and then we'll send them over. Everyone was excited at the Somali Center. Uh, my doctoral student was excited. She got this grant up and running. And uh, we sent our students over, and it was a colossal failure. It bombed. Uh, the students came back and said, OK, we told them, open the books. And we realized they weren't quite sure how to hold the books, which way did they orient them. They weren't sure which way to turn the pages. These were pre literate learners, students from limited or interrupted formal education. So we know that Somalia has been in civil war for generations and for decades. And so these uh, learners uh, were pre-literate and we, shame on us in the TESOL program had not, so our, our our strand of the TESOL program at BU is not the K-12 licensure track. The part that I'm involved with is the college and adult track. So we had never focused on teaching pre-literacy students. Uh, now, I had attended um, sessions at AAAL um, and probably TESOL run by Elaine Tyrone and Martha Bigelow and others in Minnesota who were publishing extensively on pre working with pre-literate or SLIFE learners, but we hadn't focused on that. Okay, so, so this, this event um, sort of shook me up. Simultaneously, take a look over here at the curriculum guide. The second thing that was happening was one of my incoming doctoral students had been teaching in the university-based uh, academically oriented intensive English program. And for many, many years, she was teaching the reading and writing section of integrated skills. The way this program operates, the students are there from nine until four. Nine until noon is integrated skills, and then the afternoon is electives. And the way that they do uh, integrated skills is that the, they, they team teach. So one teacher will handle reading and writing, and the other will handle listening and speaking. I sent one of our master students there. He came to me in week three. Uh, so that would have been one, two, three, four, five, after five class meetings in his practicum assignment. He came to my office and said, I'm kind of puzzled. The strange thing is happening. Um, the teacher plays a podcast or a TED talk or something, and then the students are supposed to answer the comprehension questions, and they always just throw up their hands and say, no, no, I don't understand, play it again. And then she complies and she will explain what the topic of the podcast is or whatever, and she'll play it again and again. And eventually the students can answer the questions, but I think they're answering on the basis of her explanations. And that happens all the time. What do I do? So I suggested, well, you know, talk to the teacher, you know, ask what's going on. Uh, and, and now we go to the, 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 the incoming uh, doctoral student and she got reassigned from typically teaching reading and writing 
And suddenly they were telling her, you've got to do the listening speaking part. Or, you know, or, or nothing, <laughs> take it or leave it. If you, want to, if you want to teach again next semester, this is what you can do. So she said, okay, fine, I'll teach the listening and speaking. And she went and looked at the curriculum guidelines for help. And it, it didn't help. <laughs> they looked very familiar. They looked exactly like the reading and writing guidelines that she was familiar with because she'd been teaching reading and writing. So let's take a look at what's going on. What are these lessons from SLIFE? Uh, let's go back. If we think about, she'd been teaching reading and writing and she knew the curriculum guidelines. It said the students will understand, I'm sorry, I'm gonna go, oops, go back. The students will understand main ideas and significant details. And uh, so she, she knew the reading and writing guidelines. And of course, obviously that requires that they know how to read and they can decode the orthographic input. <laughs> But now she's teaching listening and speaking, that's her new assignment, and the guidelines say students will understand the main points and the significant details in lectures and conversations. Huh. And she, of course this is a good goal, but the question is, okay, but what do I do? So what she came to me about was, okay, we start in two weeks, what do I do? I, I don't know how to make this happen. Uh, because obviously, and, and this is where I saw the link with the Somali Development Center. When we're teaching pre-literate learners, we suddenly have this huge awareness. We can't just say, here, read this, now answer the questions. And yet it seemed like in the classroom, what we're doing is saying, okay, listen to this, now answer the questions. And we're calling that teaching. We're calling that teaching listening. Um, so I began to realize, well, wait a minute, the prerequisite skill, if you're doing listening, is being able to process the input. And then I started looking at the many textbooks on the market, and the textbooks on the market often begin with note-taking skills. And if you begin with note-taking skills, it seems to me that presupposes that the students have understood what was being said, they just don't quite know how to organize it or something of that sort. So for me, the big eye opener was we had that eye opener experience with reading with pre-literate learners. We need to have that same awareness when it comes to teaching listening that we can't just give them something to listen to and say no answer. So this is what we, when I was working with my master's students um, and he came to me saying, I don't know what to do. I said, why don't you talk to your host teacher and say, this is what I'm observing and see what your host teacher says. So he did that. Uh, he said to her evidently, okay, I'm, I'm only here Tuesdays, Thursdays, and I can see that you're assessing listening. When do, when do the students actually get taught how to listen? And the host teacher's response, you can see it here. So this shouldn't be new to us. I'm sure this is very familiar to all of you. Any of you who used to hear David Mendelssohn in the early days of TESOL, when I first started going to TESOL conferences, David Mendelssohn, uh, and in fact, um, if you don't know who David Mendelssohn is, but if you're a member of TESOL and you're a member of SPLIS, David Mendelssohn is the person who put the L in SPLIS. When it was first created by Judy Gilbert, it was speaking pronunciation interest section. And then Judy Gilbert and David Mendelssohn worked together. And it took several years to go through all of the you know, administrative stuff within TESOL to put L in spliss, so to put the listening in. Um, and I used to love hearing David Mendelssohn uh, at the conferences. Uh, and of course, what he focused on is what my student teacher experienced. Um, I, I am teaching listening. Tuesdays and Thursdays, I teach listening. I play a podcast and then I have them answer the comprehension questions. I'm teaching listening. Uh, so we should know from what David Mendelssohn told us uh, so long ago. <clears throat> so here's what I think maybe it's helpful for us to think about for today. We'll talk about why listening matters, which all of you know, because that's why you came here today. What are the challenges for both learners and, and for us as instructors? Uh, and what should the uh, SLOs, the student learning outcomes be. 
and where do we go? So, um, in fact, Marcia mentioned this before. Uh, so, uh, obviously, the, the very fundamental one of the so-called integrated skills is the listening. Uh, and people have described it as the key to learning in a classroom. Uh, and then here, this is what Marsha was talking about, over 50% of the time that we spend in the classroom is listening. Uh, and uh, Christine Go, uh, who um, has written and published so much uh, in, in the area of listening, uh, says, well, this can facilitate L2 acquisition. Uh, I think she put this in the... Um, the foreword to our little listening in the classroom book that um, Tamara Jones and I uh, came out with last this past year. Uh, and so my, uh, my gateway motif um, comes from this quote by Mannion and Mercer, uh, ability to listen is the gateway to understanding. Okay, so clearly it matters, but it, it's also difficult <laughs> to teach. So we have these, uh, you know, reading and writing and listening and speaking, um, but uh, Nation and Newton claim that this is often the most overlooked of these skills, the so-called integrated skills uh, in the classroom. And there are lots of reasons. I mean, when our students speak, of course, we can hear what they're doing. And if it's not on target, we might, we might recognize that and know what to do. But when they're sitting there listening, we can't necessarily tell, are they processing uh, what is being said? Although sometimes we can tell if they're just half listening. <laughs> <At any rate. clears throat> okay. So it's the skill that uh, over which the learners feel they've got the least control. Uh, and also, you know, John Murphy did an interesting survey of teachers, and he found that listening is one of the skills, even in Matt Tessel programs, teachers are not always taught how to teach listening. Uh, and one of the um, most useful and helpful texts that I have read is the one from Larry Vandergrift and Christine Go. I went to their talk. I don't remember if it was AAAL or TESOL, but the year 2012, when the book came out, they did a rollout of this book. Uh, and I find this so informative because they've, they've surveyed learners and have really gotten to the heart of what is wrong and why. Okay, so, uh, and again, we take this quote here. They have assumed that perhaps what is happening when we go to teach listening is we come out of this from our work in teaching reading. And there's this influence of the reading pedagogy that carries over into trying to teach listening. Uh, and so they looked at this as kind of text oriented uh, listening where the focus is on the product of, of, of the passage uh, and not necessarily the process of doing the listening. Uh, so uh, now uh, Suzanne Graham has written extensively. She's one of my heroes in this area. And she basically points out the obvious. Often it's unidirectional. Again, it's listen to this, now answer the questions, as opposed to being interactive. So she has summarized it this way. So let's take a look. This is manageable. This is all doable. Vandergrift and Go figure out, OK, there are two major problems. One, is it the case that students can understand what was said? That's the first level. <laughs> first, we have to make sure they can understand what was said. And then they realize that the learners themselves seem to realize that they reach a kind of threshold level where they can understand every word that's been said. And they begin to realize, but maybe they missed the point because other people are reacting differently or their reactions aren't quite appropriate. So understanding all the words somehow isn't sufficient. So it's two layers, two levels. Can you understand what was said? Can you understand what was meant by what was said? That gets into speaker intent. So that takes us to a different level. Okay, so uh, we've got these challenges. 
Uh, and they literally break it down as, can the students recognize known words in rapid speech? So again, think back to my story about my learners back in the mid seventies who complained. They, they could talk quite well, but they couldn't understand ordinary average everyday conversations. Words that they themselves knew and could use, they couldn't understand in continuous speech at a natural pace. So that means se segmenting a continuous speech stream. How do we segment a continuous speech stream? Uh, and then ability number two, the challenge number two, understanding the speaker's intent. And there, um, and this is one of the skills that I think is often, most often overlooked, even in research informed textbooks, even, like I will say, you know, my 2005 co-authored textbook, I dealt with it, but in the hands of a teacher who, especially a native speaker teacher, for whom this was all so obvious, it, it may not work. Um, so I'm thinking of, you know, the Linda Grant, well said, and Judy Gilbert's clear speech and Sue Miller's, um, what is Miller's uh, understanding English or, uh, oh dear, I'm blanking on Miller, but anyway, um, even with these research informed textbooks, um, the, the students may do the, may be led in doing the exercises without getting to the underlying what's going on here. Okay, so what do we do? The good news, this is Vander Plank, who co-authored often with Suzanne Graham and others, said, all of this is teachable. <laughs> if we don't teach it, the students are gonna make very slow progress or maybe none, but if we do, they can get it. And a good way to get at it is metacognitive strategy use, making the students aware of what they're doing, where it fails, what to do when it fails, uh, and then move forward. Uh, we can work on things like the top-down and bottom-up strategies. Predict. They point out that a lot of teachers will say, okay, you're going to hear something about, now what do you expect to hear? So very often teachers do do the predicting, pre-listening. All right, this is the topic. What words do you expect to hear? What do you think that they're going to talk about? What Vanderplank and others noted is we don't necessarily always go back and say, okay, did you hear those words? So maybe those words were said, but the students couldn't catch them in connected continuous speech. Uh, and, and then maybe there were other words that they weren't anticipating and so forth. So in other words, doing the pre-listening, pre um, many teachers do that, but then what they're saying is you combine that with strategies to go back and verify. You so, uh, and, and this could be just simply playing a podcast, not to understand what it says. You expected to hear these, let's say five words, given topic X, you expect to hear, let's choose five of these words. Okay, let's listen, everybody. Just check it off. Did you hear these words? Something as simple as that. Those words might've been there, but the students may not have pulled them out of a continuous speech stream. Okay, so the issue here then is the speech segmentation. Um, and we wanna focus on the word recognition strategies. What are the strategies that people use? Well, John Field has described these. Often the students will substitute words that they know for what was actually said. <laughs> and they will continue listening to a whole passage assuming that it's about what they think they heard, and they're very reluctant to give up on a wrong guess. Um, they can't seem to suppress these wrong choices. And I'm gonna show you, what does this look like in practice? I'm about to show you what this looks like in practice. They hear something, they try to relate it to something that they can recognize, and they go with that to try to interpret the whole rest of the passage. Uh, and very often uh, they can catch content words, but they may miss the grammatical glue words that hold everything together. Okay, what does this look like? Okay, so I told you that when I was in this language school and we convinced the director to, to let us teach listening and we, we decided on day one, oh, let's, let's do some diagnostics. And um, I dictated the sentence, oh, tell her I'll meet her at the bank. And 
then we looked at the students' responses. So they heard Teller, and maybe, I, I, I think I was not deliberately priming them with at the bank, but they may have thought, okay, bank teller. We're talking about bank tellers somehow. And there's such a thing as a teller. And meter, well, there are parking meters and there are taxi meters and there are, uh, you know, so, so they're listening to a stream of speech. They're trying to pull out words. And then they're, in this case, all we did was dic you know, dictate isolated sentences. But if I had given them a whole passage about this, tell her I'll meet her at the bank, um, bank teller and parking meter or taxi meter, those kinds of things would not have panned out, right? So this is what we discovered uh, in the um, activity. So this got me thinking about connected speech processes. And these have been written about extensively. So in the um, uh, pronunciation handbook that uh, Marsha mentioned, um, John Levis and one of his doctoral students, um, Himwa Almin, did a whole chapter on connected speech processes, but you know, you can Google that and find lots. And um, I also have pulled up and can share with you a more extensive um, list of connected speech processes. Um, but basically, it, it, it's just realizing that words are linked. <laughs> So tell her just runs together. Also, sounds are deleted. So the H, and this is very systematic. And we know that for children acquiring English as a first language, when they learn how to read and write, then they learn uh, the silent H in words like hour, what hour of the day, or the heir to the throne, and honor, and so forth. So they, they learn about silent H, but our students don't. And that silent H occurs very specifically in the words he, her, him, and then the word his when his is used as an adjective, not when his is used as a pronoun. So it's a finite set, so therefore we can introduce it, we can practice it, and I have some slots, some um, work exercise sheets I can show you for how to do that. But this basically is what we came to realize, my, my fellow teacher and I, oh, this is what they mean when they say they can't understand us. Hmm, connected speech processes. Okay, so that's listening challenge one. I think that there's a second listening challenge. So one of the things that I noticed one time uh, with one of my student teachers, was that he dictated sentences for the students and then he had students go up on the board and write down the sentences that, that he had dictated. And I was just sitting there, you know, doing my field supervision and I was writing down his dictated sentences and I had written one of them down. And then I looked at the blackboard and the student had, student went to the blackboard and he wrote the sentence, he looked up. And I looked at my notes and I thought, wait a minute, I thought that my student teacher said he looked it up. Huh. So what do you think? This is your chance to tell me what do you think is going on? Uh, oh, never mind. Uh, I, I, well, that's what I'm telling you, I guess. But we know this. If our students pronounce the word look plus an ed ending as two syllables looked, that's their acoustic image. In their head, look plus ed is two syllables looked. So let's count. He, my student teacher dictated, he looked it up. So he looked it up. I get four rhythmic beats, da, 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 da. He looked it up. Now, if the student's mental image of look plus ED is look ed, then you get he look it up. You get four rhythmic beats. So the students were hearing, he looked up like the sky's gonna fall when, this, when actually we're talking about looking something up in a reference source. They're mishearing. And so, uh, and I have worked with many um, te ESL teachers who say, oh, past tense endings, it's not teachable, and all those third person S's, uh, if I give them a grammar test, they know it's fine, whatever. But, but it can interfere with their listening. And again, these endings, all of this is teachable. So my co-author and I have come up with a very, very simple checklist. 
basically with the ed endings they don't usually make a mistake between putting let's say a voiced ending d on uh, attached to a word that it ends in an unvoiced sound um that they don't say i plate soccer they say i played soccer so they don't usually miss the the, the uh, assimilated t ending or the default d ending what they usually do is add an extra syllable where it doesn't belong and we can give them a mental checklist if the final sound is a t or a d add the extra syllable no t or d no extra syllable that's teachable and then students can internalize that. So if you want to say look plus past tense ed, then you just say, does look, does it end in a T or a D? Okay, no. So can you add the extra syllable? Uh, I guess not. And then you must give the students time to wrap their articulators around putting together back-to-back -back consonant sounds that may exceed the syllable structure of their native language. So if I want to say, uh, so looked is not such a problem, asked. <laughs> so let's take a language uh, like Spanish. The coda of a syllable could be two consonants. Three exceeds the maximum allowable end of a word or a syllable in Spanish. So getting them to say, um, you know, asked as a, a good example, um, it, 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 you need to give them time to, to put together three consonants at the end of the word. Uh, even if they say, okay, I can't say asked, which frankly is easier to pronounce. <laughs> My point here is this is teachable. It, th this is one of those wonderfully rare things in English that is systematic, it's predictable, it's rule governed. There's so much that isn't, you know, nouns followed by, I mean, verbs followed by infinitives. Oh, verbs followed by gerunds. Oh, verbs that could be followed by infinitives or gerunds. That's hard to teach. This stuff is absolutely systematic absolutely predictable, totally rule governed. That means it's teachable. That means it's learnable. So you can use a little checklist. And the same thing for the third person. And now this principle is true. The principle for the uh, ED past tense or past participle ending is also true. The same principle applies for nouns, countable nouns, plural, possessives, or third person singular verbs. It's all the same. Right. If the final sound is unvoiced, you add an unvoiced ending like S. If it's voiced, you add the voiced ending Z. And but now the list becomes longer for when you add the extra syllable us. Basically, you have to add it to any of the sibilant sounds. Right? But again, that's teachable. Okay. Uh, I'm not following chat, but maybe if there's a conf is there a question. Oh, strengths. <laughs> strengths is a marvelous one. Strengths um, is interesting because here, phonemically, there are three phonemes at the end of that word, but phonetically, there are four because we add a k sound. You know, I, my, my um, linguistic students always talk about Noam Chomsky, <laughs> but his name isn't Chomsky. But when you, when you transition from uh, bilabial mm, and then you go back to velar k, um, chom, Chomsky, they, then they end up putting a p a P sound in there, but there's no P in Chomsky, right? Um, so with the word strengths, we add a velar k sound when we transition from the velar engma mm, and we go forward to the interdental theta, then we add uh, a K. <laughs> oh, targeting, thank you, thank you. Targeting pronunciation, yes, Sue Miller, marvelous, marvelous. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so let's move ahead now to listening challenge number two. So. We, so van der Grift and Go noted, one of the students' complaints is they can't understand. Even though they can say things, they can't understand the very kinds of stuff that they can say when they hear other people say it. Now they reach a certain threshold level where they can understand what's being said. And they begin to realize, but I'm missing something. What am I missing? And 
I find this this kind of classroom exchange happens all the time. You know, your teacher, your syllabus is going to say late penalty, 10 points, no late assignments, you're going to lose points. But nevertheless, the students are going to say, oh, please, please, can I turn in my assignment late? And you're going to say, well, you can. And the student's going to say, oh, thank you. <laughs> so what are they not hearing that the rest of us hear? Uh, so these words are affirmative. So what is this telling us? Students are paying attention to the words. And, and, and I have, you know, um, if, we, if we think about um, ah, Linda Grant, uh, her pronunciation myths, page 125. I'm 100% sure it's page 125. Da, 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 da. Judy Gilbert says, that if, you, if the students will say they think intonation is just decorative, can't change the meaning. And she says, you know, they, they, she basically says they won't tell you that they think this is silly. Well, I did a study, I published it in the handbook that John, Wiley, John Levis and I did. I did a study where I asked the students, they were in a language lab, they spent 50, five, zero, 50 minutes doing one sentence where one of the words on the written page was in italics and they needed to superimpose a pitch contour and they wouldn't. And the teacher did imitation, repeat after me, modeling. Finally, they did it. Finally, they recorded themselves. They sounded really good. The teacher left. I was doing my sabbatical, so I, I was uh, very fortunate to be invited there. Uh, the students were packing up their stuff. I said, wait, 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 you sounded really good. You did it. Will you start using this now? And they said, no. It's ridiculous. I feel foolish. This is silly. So I said, well, wait, 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 wait. So, so you just practiced this one sentence. It was in Linda Grant's Well Said book. The sentence was something along the lines of, there are some, that was the italicized words, or some companies in the high-tech sector that sell a wide variety of products. And that was the sentence that they had to record. And they would look at each other and roll their eyes, and finally they would do it. And in the end, they sounded really good. And then they told me, I, it's ridiculous, it's silly, I feel foolish, I, I'll never do it. Uh, so I said, well, wait a minute, if you're all headed to college or grad school, if you walked into a classroom and the professor said something, let's say you're in a marketing class or something, the professor said, well, there are some companies in the high tech sector that sell a wide variety of products. Um, could you predict what the topic of the next sentence is? And they just looked at me like, um, how would I know? Uh, and I said, because of the intonation contour you just used. And I thought I pulled a save that day. And I walked out and I started bragging about this in my methods class. And my research assistant came up to me later and said, shall I tell you what happened after you left? I wasn't gonna tell you at first, but I hear that you're bragging about this. After you left, one person said, this could be important. The second person said, nah, she's just the research lady. <laughs> and the third person said, if intonation was so important, someone would have told us by now. So the teacher was making them do it, getting production, but not a metalinguistic understanding. So I think this kind of exchange happens all the time in the classroom. Now the question is, um, do the teachers know what's going on and how to uh, fix it or advance it? Okay, so what's the challenge here? It's these pragmatic functions. Can the students understand that the intonation isn't just decorative, as, as uh, Judy Gilbert sa says that the students think, it actually has the power to either reinforce or mitigate or even undermine the words spoken. And I've put a little example here that this is a late acquisition. And the story here comes from the literature and child language acquisition. A little first grader gets off the school bus and he's all excited and he tells his mommy, oh, Joey liked my new backpack. And the mother says, oh, that's nice. How do you know he likes your new backpack? And the little first grader says, because I told him it was my new backpack and he said, big deal. So for children acquiring English as their first language, 
paying attention to the intonation contour takes time. And no wonder our, our adult learners may also have difficulty with this. So we need to pay attention then to the pragmatic functions of intonation. And what does that mean? Well, John Wells tells us speakers can imply something, but they don't necessarily even have to say it. So well, you can, the next word is but, it's gonna cost you. Uh, typically say one thing implies something further or leave off some kind of implication. Okay, so how, what do we deal, how, what do we do to deal with this? I think one way we can look at it is to include this metalinguistic awareness, getting the students to repeat or mimic, we can do that. And students might even do it on their own if they want to imitate us and make fun of us and you know, whatever, parody us. They can do it, but do they understand its functions? What is it doing? So if we think about the drawing quote here, intelligibility, what do we think about that? Speaker's message has to be understood. John Levis extends that and says, okay, this broad definition implies identifying words. This is Levis's uh, interpretation of the intelligibility principle and understanding a speaker's intended meaning. So these are the two areas that we need to think about. How do we do it? And that's from his guidelines. I think that there's a link between getting the students to produce it and their ability to, to, to then hear it not only at the level of understanding the words, but understanding the intonation contours as well. So I see a kind of perception production feedback loop, uh, a closed circuit feedback loop. And I've described that in certain ways uh, that if we get the students to say something, then they hear it. I'll just give you the quickest story. When I lived in Japan, uh, I learned the name of my town so that I could you know, go back and forth and work. I worked at Sony Corporation, but I depended on counting the train stops. I, um, the trains were always crowded. I couldn't always look out the window and read the signs of the stations. So I would count, okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, get off, change trains, one, two, three, four, get off. And I would be at work and then reverse. One day my students asked me, did you find an apartment? I said, yes, where is it? I told them. And they said, where's that? And they, you know, I, I showed them my train pass and then they pronounced the name of my town. And I said, that's what I just told you. And they said, not even close. They spent the day teaching me how to say the name of my town, how to pronounce it. Okay, I got on the train, one, two, three, four, get off, change trains, one, two, three, four. I'm getting close to the end and I'm getting ready to get off the train. And if you've ever ridden the train in Japan, you know that they're always making announcements, nonstop announcements. All of a sudden, crystal clear, I heard one word. I heard the name of my town. And it occurred to me, they must be, I'm a country gal. I, I wasn't used to riding subways. I didn't know that they announced the names of the train stops. So I thought, well, this is convenient. I don't have to count anymore. And then I thought, wait a minute, I've been riding the train for two weeks. Why didn't I hear it? Why have I been counting for two weeks? I heard it the day my pronunciation matched or converged with the actual pronunciation. I pulled one word out of the speech stream. So what do we do? Well, I think that we wanna find out what the teacher, what the students think, because what they think is going to affect what they do. Uh, so let's ask them some questions. Um, it, oh, everybody speaks too fast. If they didn't speak so fast, I could understand them. So we get this before we do any instruction, ask them what they think. Then, um, at the end, we're going, to, we're going to give the same two questions. And at the end, we want them to be able to say, oh, no, 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 no. The problem isn't speed of speech. The problem is connected speech features. And now I know the trick. I know words are linked. I know sounds are deleted. I know connected speech stuff. Uh, when listening, I pay attention to the content words because the little words aren't important. Uh, and we're going to give them examples where uh, the little words, uh, if they get, miss the little words, they might miss everything. So here's your chance, use chat, fill in the blanks. Um, this is what we give the students to, um, for their listening comprehension. So even if you didn't write it in chat, we've all got it, right? So Dave was, and I'm hearing you all say in his late 20s, and it would not be accurate to say that 
he was living at home with his parents, but only because half the time he was staying at his sister's house. Uh, he was playing in a band, doing some writing, not making much money. And is what's and is? Uh, parents were worried, and one day he was hanging out with his mom. So, in other words, what we want to show is native speakers can fill this in without listening. We don't need a sound file. What are we doing? We're using our um, our knowledge of language to be able to fill in the blanks. So these are the, and all these are are the little content words. When they do TOEFL prep, they're told listen to the content words. Don't pay attention to the little words; they're not important. Well, here, if the students can't fill in the little words, well, maybe that's okay. But then we give them comprehension questions, and they can't answer the comprehension questions. So it's not okay. Uh, I'm looking at the chat. I was in uh, to uh, Sony Corporation, 1970 to 72, <laughs> so I was there a little bit earlier. Okay, uh, so now what are these decoding strategies? What is it that native speakers are doing? We're listening to something like Izzy Busy, <laughs> and we're hearing the connections. Uh, Idov, uh, Idol. Uh, one of my student teachers came back to me one day and said something really embarrassing happened in class. The students were reading aloud. It was time for a morning break. They came back from the break. The teacher said, okay, let's pick up where we left off. And she called on a student and said, okay, will you start reading where it says it'll? And the student froze. And then she said, you know, so-and-so, let's, let's resume where we left off. Would you start reading where it says it'll? And then he turns to a, another student and starts, you know, asking for help. The teacher's getting exasperated. Just start reading where it says it'll. What's an it'll? When your students encounter contracted words, do they feel, do they read them as contracted or no, of course they don't. No, which, which, is, which is their choice, that's fine, but they've got to be able to decode what's an it'll. Um, Tamara Jones gives an interesting story of students who were preparing to have a little a picnic or something. So-and-so won't bring the hot dogs and so-and-so will bring the chips and Bob will bring the sodas. And somebody said, teacher, what's a bobble? What's mean bobble? So contractions, words are linked. And now here I'm showing you, this could be final, the same final consonant, consonant to consonant, could be a different final consonant, could be a consonant to vowel, could be vowel to vowel. So they need to practice linking all these words. So if the students know what the words sound like in the dictionary, the dictionary citation form, do they know those words when they're in continuous speech, when they're connected? I mentioned H deletion. Oops, I'm sorry. Uh, whoops. Oh, I want to go backwards. Oh, that's not working. Sorry. Oh, wait, I know. Uh, um, H deletion, but you need to be clear. Um, if it's the first word in a sentence, it's not deleted. So he's late, no deletion. Where is he? H is deleted. Is he on his way? Is he coming? Et cetera. And with a wait and see, the and goes away. Uh, we know about uh, altered sounds, contracted sounds, and so forth. Okay. By the way, um, one of the things that we find really useful is um, if you, maybe most of you know about Uglish, but I love the one with it'll. Uh, so when we found out that students weren't doing con contracted sounds, we just plugged in it'll. And one of the things that came up was, I think this is Diana Nyatt who swam the English channel, right? Uh, so just listen, so the students can hear how many ways it'll is being pronounced. <coughs> and there are many of these technologies that you're undoubtedly all familiar with. All right, let's go to the second challenge. What do we do here? Again, we're going to do pre and post. Before you do instruction, you can ask, okay, if I understand all the words, all is good. I can understand the meaning, true or false, you agree or disagree. Intonation is just decorative, can't change the meaning, agree or disagree. Then you do the instruction and then you give these same questions at the end and you hope that their metalinguistic awareness will have increased, even if they're not good yet at the skill level. Okay, so I've used this one very often. Uh, the teacher didn't grade the exams. And the question is, have the exams been graded? When I have done this, always, the students will repeat, didn't grade, didn't grade. You said didn't grade. And then they'll ask me to play the sound file again. No, didn't grade, it says didn't grade. 
So they're paying attention to the words, they're not paying attention to the intonation contour, but play this for a native speaker in English and they will hear, well, the teacher didn't, somebody else did, maybe the TA. Okay, so what do we know? Well, John Levis tells us a lot of this. What do the textbooks do? They often give the syntactic functions of intonation, so pause at the end of a sentence or semicolons and all those kinds of things. What are the discourse functions? So they help to know when it's time to take a turn, that's your turn to speak. Uh, differentiating yes, no questions, WH questions. A lot of the uh, work I see is in uh, emotive functions. Okay, let's begin. Here's a, here's a handout. 20 sentences. Okay, let's begin. Let's go around the room. So-and-so, read number one, pretend you're upset. Number two, read number two, pretend you're angry. Number three, read number three, pretend you're whatever. And the students will often do these exercises. What the research tells us is if you just give isolated, decontextualized sentences to native speakers, they can't tell you whether someone's angry, exasperated, or whatever. But we ask our students to do that. And what I think we often don't do is the pragmatic functions. Uh, and, and even the textbooks which have these um, in the hands of a teacher who maybe assumes that everybody will get it, they're not focusing on why. I, I found this uh, to be one of the most um, alarming quotes, but informative. I'll let you read it. So when I've given uh, speech samples uh, where I have low pass filtered the words and I've given uh, samples of um, NHK top of the hour news broadcast, um, Le Monde top of the hour news broadcast or an NPR top of the hour news broadcast, uh, I just do maybe 45 seconds and I ask the question, does this sound like English, yes or no? English, yes or no? English, yes or no? They always nail the one that sounds like English. I ask them why sing-songy, up and down, exaggerated. So they know what English sounds like, but they don't necessarily understand, especially when we deliberately use a, a wide intonation contour. Uh, they just, as Gilbert says, think it, it's decorative and it doesn't mean anything. Okay, so Levis says, we've got a problem here. We're not necessarily dealing with what to do. So we think that curricular guidelines aren't operationalized. Students will be able to understand main ideas or whatever, whether they're reading or they're listening. Uh, and the ability is tested, it's not necessarily taught. And then we look at the learner surveys and they say, I can't understand what you're saying. I can't recognize the words or I understand, but I don't get the point. <laughs> so we need some intervention. And so here we wanted to know if the students can detect marked or uh, exaggerated or up and down or sing-songy, however they want to describe it. Can they detect that and notice that it's different from the everyday intonation of English, which they can pick out when they listen to other languages, they can pick out which one sounds like English. Can they detect when the intonation is even more? Then if they can, same or different, can they locate? Well, there was something about that particular word then can they interpret? So one, two, three, three steps, very doable. So this is what we, and then we go back to Virginia Allen, who said, teach them to understand the speaker's intent. Okay, so uh, we want to then work on the guidelines, uh, figure out what to do, and raise their uh, awareness. So uh, we want to do these um, steps where we figure out what do the students believe if they think everybody's just exaggerated and it doesn't mean anything, we have to change that. Identify the strategies they're using uh, and then assess their skills. Uh, if they're just listening to the content words, not paying attention to all of it, maybe that's not helping them understand what was said. And then we look at the same thing for the intonation. Okay, so we're going to do... Uh, figure out what their beliefs are, what strategies are they using, uh, and then assess the skills. So in the case of listening challenge two, all they have to do is detect. Can you listen to two versions of the same sentence and tell if it's the same or different? Then if you think it's different, where's the difference? And then if you have nailed where the difference is, 
then what's the speaker's intention? What's the speaker trying to do? And the choices are finite. Could be for emphasis, could be for contrast or correction. No, 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 class doesn't meet Tuesday, it meets Thursday. Option number three, there's an implication. Well, you can turn in the assignment late. Three options, manageable, doable, teachable. All right. So let's take a look at this. Uh, listening to this, um, she's not a teacher versus she's not a teacher. Can they hear that those two are different? So same or different. Now we get them to hear, oh, those two sound different. Okay, good, <laughs> that's necessary. Next, um, where is the difference? Uh, well, there's something about she's, they, they did extra intonation on she's um, or teacher. S something different about the particular word. In sample one, teacher has this extra sing-songy. And number two, it's she's. And then number three, interpret. Um, she's not a teacher. She's something else, or she's not a teacher, somebody else is a teacher. So uh, detect the difference, locate the difference, interpret the difference, doable, manageable. And there are software programs, by the way, that help us do that. <coughs> so uh, now we look at their questions. Do the sentences sound the same or different? Well, they're different. Sentence number two, the teacher had extra stress. So, okay, that's good. What does it mean? Sorry. Um, have the papers been graded? And now you get, yeah, because there was something, and, and we have to teach the, the students the word in italics or exaggerated or whatever we want them to say. Uh, this is something called the pose test, perception of spoken English, um, and, and it does the same kind of thing. So there's hard, there's software that will do this. Okay, so uh, the challenge is we've got to figure out the outcome students will be able to uh, how do we operationalize that? How do we determine evidence that they have managed these skills? And how do we uh, plan the interventions? Well, let's say something like this for connected speech. Uh, and the noun and verb endings, these are the areas we want to work on. Uh, we want to improve their ability to understand the content of what was said and figure out from a, a set of manageable options, what was the speaker's intention? So they'll understand a range of functions. This is, this is all kind of stuff that this, it's already out there. We have to say, but as measured how? How will you know that they understand a range of? How will you know that they understand extended discourse with multiple participants? Well, here you could use um, Ron Thompson's high variability training. So what's the typical way that teachers are satisfied at the end of, okay, I'm gonna play the podcast and you answer the comprehension questions. Does improvement mean that you don't have to replay it so often or that their outlines now match? Or uh, maybe there's something else that we could say. When you say, what did you learn in listening class today? Do you want them to talk about the topic of what the podcast was? Or do you want them to be able to say something like, I learned thought groups today, or I learned connected speech processes today? In other words, is it the focus on the product or are we actually helping the students with the process of decoding oral input? This is where I think the process should be. So with a metacognitive three-part strategy, we can get there. Okay, so that was it. I don't know if we have time, but I actually made some TikTok videos. So I'm going to stop share here. And Marcia, you tell me uh, if we have time for my short form videos. It'll be great. I think it'll be great uh, for you to show those. Go ahead. That'd be great. All right, I'm going to do screen share again. I hope this will work. So I made a couple of TikTok. Um, <laughs> I call them TikTok, T-A-L-K, TikTok, a short form videos. See if I can find them. Is everything else? Do you want? Do you want me to show it? Oh yeah. Okay. Can you do that? Of course. Okay. Excellent. So either one. Uh, I made two. Uh, okay. Thanks. Present. Hello. My name is Marnie Reed, and I'm a teacher educator and a professor at Boston University. This video series is to provide you with tips that address some of the challenges that English language learners have in listening and speaking. Good morning. Good morning. 
Good morning, Miss. Good morning. Can I turn in my assignment late? You can. Oh, great. Thanks. In this example, the teacher's words are affirmative, but the intended message is negative. The teacher used intonation to imply that the student should not turn in the assignment late. However, the student only paid attention to the words and missed the meaning carried by the intonation. And the, uh, the is second that cool one, or what? The, the second one came as a result of the legal English class. I sometimes get invited to go to NYU and help with the legal English class there. And the students always have to do a presentation about Supreme Court justices. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Marnie Reed, and I'm a teacher educator and a professor at Boston University. This video series is to provide you with tips that address some of the challenges that English language learners have in listening and speaking. Welcome to our student presentations. Each speaker will discuss a justice of the Supreme Court. We start with, our, with their educational backgrounds. Let's hear from our first speaker for an introduction. Here is something you might not be aware of. Did you know that all but one of the Supreme Court justices went to either Harvard or jail? In this example, the student mispronounced the first sound in the word Yale, the name of a university. And that mistake changed the word to jail, a word that means prison. In some cases, the change of one sound does not lead to confusion but sometimes it does. Okay, thank you, Marcia. <laughs> thank you for playing those. Thank you. So we can open up the floor for questions and you may unmute yourselves and give your questions and comments to our presenter. Hey, Marnie, I just have a really quick question. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, yes. Um, I wanted to see that website that you showed about Idle with the swimmer. I just, I couldn't get the name of that website and I was really curious about it. Um, was that pronunciation for teachers.com? It could it Could wasn't be. that one. It was something it like Yuglish, was it? Yuglish. Oh, Yuglish. Thank you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Y O U G L I S A. So you can type it. So, for example, supposing you want to do going to, you could type in going to. And what it does is it calls up over and over and over um, little short snippets. It could be from a podcast or a TED talk or a, a TV sitcom or a news broadcast. And sometimes the speaker will say, I'm going to, or sometimes the speaker will say, I'm going to. And so the students get to hear the differences, all these different things. Youglish, if you, you can use it for so many things. It's fabulous. Thank you. Great, great question. Yes. Yeah, okay. Randy brought up a good question. Did you see it in the chat, Marnie? I know, uh, Randy. Uh, a low pass filter. Oh, so low pass filter. <laughs> yes, of course, the technical person would ask that. Um, what I did was take these uh, just regular news broadcasts and I ran it through a system. Um, so I'm not sure I'm going to remember now what it was, but what the system did was take out the actual words. So it, the effect would be as if you were, you can hear that there's someone speaking in the next room, but you can't necessarily make out the, the, the words that they are saying. You can just hear somebody speaking. Um, and I basically had my tech people do it. So I don't remember what software they used. Um, but it, it, it's a fairly simple one. And if, Randy, if you're interested, you can ask and I will um, I find out you know, you know, technically how you, lo you, you filter out um, the, um, you know, one, one stream. Yep. Um. Oh, audacity. Yes, probably audacity. Wait a minute. Are you, no, are you trying to filter out the, uh, wait, are you trying to filter out or are you trying to make the, the, the listening close? Because those are two different things. 
No, filter filter it so that you can hear someone speaking, but you can't make out the words. Marnie, I had a question about um, the debate in our field regarding perception and production. Yeah. I know when yeah. it comes to um, segmentals and in general, uh, the feeling is that perception precedes production, but we know that there are, well, there's at least one research um, study where they found that, I think it was Japanese students, when they worked on production first of L versus R, then they were able to pre um, perceive it better. And I was just wondering, um, in the example that you gave when you were living in Japan, if per perhaps when you were working with your students and you were able to say the name of the city that you were going to and you got feedback from them, that that might have helped you to identify it um, better. And also thinking about some of the students that I've worked with. So for example, the difference between that when it's stressed and that when it's not stressed as a relative pronoun. I had a student who would always say, when she wanted to say, he saw that it was great, um, she would say, he saw that it was great. And because she was emphasizing that and pausing after the word that, um, people were misunderstanding. And so when we started working on it from a productive um, position or practice, practicing it, then it seemed like she was able to understand it better. So anyway, what do you think? What's oh, your the, this is great. I, I love your relative pronoun example. That's perfect. Okay, so um, a couple things. When I was, I once, once was asked to do something at the Defense Language Institute in San Antonio when, when TESOL and AAAL were in San Antonio. And I spent the day there and I listened to, um, th these are air traffic controllers and uh, airline pilots. And, um, there was one who, um, so, th so they were given coordinates and they were told, you know, plan, script your request for clearance to take off. And then they did role plays. And so the first role play was an Arabic speaker and a Korean speaker. The Arabic speaker wanted clearance for his departure. So Arabic does not have I, so I think P is an allophonic variation of B. So he was not making that distinction. The Korean speaker wanted clearance for his departure. And the teacher kept saying, no, 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 it's not departure, it's departure. Do it again. And I was just sitting there. And when I, whenever I go and observe a student teacher or whatever, I tend to take a notepad and I just write down what's going on. I counted hash marks 15, one five, 15 times. The teacher said, no, it's not departure, it's departure. Repeat it after me. And finally, the student just blew up and said, I am repeating after you. So what do the students hear? Um, so, so your question, your question is exactly the right question. Historically in our field, the belief is perception first, then production. Teach them, can you hear this distinction now? Let's start practicing it. And if that works, fine, do it that way, no problem. But when it does not work, as in 15 times to say it's not departure, it's departure. When it does not work, then I think you have to go the other way around. You have to get the students to produce it and the payoff is then they can perceive it. So when I was an ESL classroom teacher, I would divide my blackboard. Over here is the stuff you have to do all the time, like third person singular verb endings and all the morpho syntax stuff. Now over here, this is where we're just gonna put stuff to practice. You don't have to do this. I don't, it doesn't matter to me if you do it or not, but in this classroom, you're going to practice it. And the benefit will be that outside of the classroom, you're going to start to recognize it because it's a closed circuit auditory feedback loop. So when we get them to produce it themselves, and I put something, there's an, so you, you cited the, um, uh, Colleen, you cited the study by Winifred Strange and Catherine Best. And there are, there are more recent studies. Um, and, uh, so Leinbaugh and Rausch, um, Michael Roche, I think, they are in New Zealand, um, the University of Auckland, I think. They have done this with Arabic speakers. There are, there are some studies now that look at can you get the students to produce it? And if you get their production to match closely with the target, 
will the payoff be that they can perceive it? And the answer seems to be yes. So I would say do the typical route first, but if it doesn't work, then work on their production and make the production as close as possible to the target, and then they'll hear it. Thanks. Thank you. Perception cycle. Yes, very nice. Marsha, yes. <laughs> good. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, good. You, this definitely works. Oh, is it, when doing dictation, is it better to separate the words deliberately? No, 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 no. Um, so I told you about my my uh, director who who let us go ahead and do this extra, you know, uh, listening um, class. I got fired from that that school. <laughs> um, he would just hire random teachers, and he hired a teacher who articulated each word slowly and carefully in her teaching. And the students began coming to me and saying, oh, I'm confused. You know, we go in your class at eight o'clock in the morning and we're learning this. And then we go next door. And then, and so they began complaining to me. And then ultimately, I complained to the director. I basically said, I don't want the students who show up at eight o'clock in the morning. I don't want them in that class because she's undoing everything we're doing. I got fired. And that's how I started my doctoral studies. I couldn't find a job. So I said, oh, I'll go back to school. <laughs> But I, yeah, um, so no, do not articulate. So the students are accustomed to the citation form. They know what these words are like in isolation. The problem is they don't know what these words sound like. And so that goes back to, you know, when you preview, what words do you expect to hear when you listen to this podcast? Okay, now the question is, can they recognize those very words when those very words occur in continuous running speech, not in isolation? And that may be where the problem is. These are great questions. Okay. I just want to say it's, it's really great. I'm, thank, I'm thanking you very much for your wonderful presentation. As we know, listening needs to be remembered by our teachers as the other partner to speaking and that we need to know the difference between testing or assessing what people heard and comprehended and teaching our learners how to listen, what to listen to, what things are important, no matter what level you're at, and which things come later as, as students become more proficient in the language. So mm -hmm. all of what you brought to us today is a lot for us to handle. Wouldn't you agree that's all useful to us? <laughs> yeah, but you're, 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 things are so good too. So, I mean, I'm learning. I never would have thought of the uh, relative pronoun that. That's, that was a great example, I agree. It, it's really great. And I really wanted to say for all of us that we could remove our uh, X's on our mics and give a big round of applause <laughs> to Ms. Marnie Reed. Dr. Reed has presented us with some really good, good thinking and processes for approaching the teaching of listening in our classrooms, whether it is a pronunciation class or just a regular kind of a class for English language learners. I also want to remind you that as a member of CATISAL, we will be able to communicate continually on our message board at CATISAL Talk at CATISAL.org. We also have a Facebook group, which you are welcome to join if you are Facebook members. We have all of these other benefits that I mentioned to you before, but most importantly, now what I'd like, thank you very much for your participation in today's webinar. And once again, thank you very much to Dr. Marnie Reed for the and thank you. presentation. Thank you, Marsha. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you everyone for coming and for all these wonderful comments in chat and questions.